Right, hello and welcome everybody to today's meeting of City of York Council's uh, Planning Committee B. Uh, my name's Councillor Hollier, I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, regular viewers will know the committee members are sat down either side. Uh, to my right, we've got Gareth Arnold, who's the development manager. Uh, to my left, Jay Miller, who's our democracy officer and taking the minutes. Uh, and then planning officers, sort of slight revolving door, uh, depending on applications, uh, sit over there. Um, but at the moment, we've got Mark Baldry, but if, it, if that changes, um, I'm not sure if it will. Uh, they'll introduce themselves at that time. Um, if I could ask then if there are any declarations of interest. Oh, oh, Councillor Lucker. I, I'm not um, I'm not excusing myself from the meeting, but I do want to say as, as a local ward councillor, I have had quite a lot of um, brief informal briefings around the Minster site. But I am not, I haven't predetermined the, the situation. Um, I was waiting very much to see what it was going to look like. Um, and I appreciated the opportunity for the virtual site visits yesterday. So, okay. but I thought I'd better just mention it okay. for clarity. Thank you. Um, just notice so I've got apologies from Councillor Crawshaw and Councillor, oh, Councillor Crackhill, sorry. Well, I thought I'd better say that I am neither am I predetermined on the uh, minister applications, but I am a ward councillor as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And uh, just to say, we've got apologies from Councillor Crawshaw, uh, Councillor Daubney, and Councillor Galvin. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw is substituted by Councillor Looker, uh, and Councillor Daubney substituted by Councillor Penton. So, uh, welcome to you both. Move on then to the minutes of the last meeting, which was the 11th of August. Um, I've got a couple of amendments uh, finally sent through by Councillor Melly. Um, so the suggestion is to add at the final bullet point um, of the uh, paragraph referring to the comments of Peter Rowlings, Rowlings or Rollings, uh, to add in uh, with young families into the final sentence of the last bullet point. Um, if we could also amend the record of the votes, um, which currently says six members voting in favour and one abstention, two four in favour, two against and one abstention. Uh, and then there's a couple of minor typos as well, the numbering. Um, minor issues like that. So with, with those changes, if we're happy to accept the minutes. I think so. Okay, thank you very much. I'll sign those later. Uh, there's no public participation to the general remit of the committee, so I think we can move straight on to the plans list. And the first item uh, is the former storage facility site uh, in Dunnington. And Gareth, if you're able to make a start. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is uh, an application for a new storage and office building uh, for Northern Power Grid. Uh, the application, sorry, the new building will uh, be about 1,500 square metres in floor area. Uh, and it is for both office use and uh, storage and distribution use. So the site is within an, an existing industrial estate. So I'll just go through the, um, uh, go through the, the, the presentation. Um, right in the top corner. I'm sure that shows. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is a Hull Road in Dunnington, and then Common Lane, which goes up towards the Dunnington Village itself. And this whole area is uh, is an industrial estate, and residential properties fronting Hull Road. The elevations. This section being the the office building, this section being the uh, the warehouse storage building. A floor plan, again, reiterating what I said, offices, and this, uh, what they call, what they term the logistics warehouse. And roof plan, which shows their uh, solar PV panels on the south facing roof. Um, this is the uh, Google Globe view. I've, I've picked up the fact that it's actually quite out of date. 
Um, so uh, the site is entirely cleared, and it, as far as we can see, it has been since about 2017. So this, this building here has now been demolished, uh, as has this building, and a new storage uh, building uh, has been built on this uh, just outside the site here. So I updated it with this Google view, which shows the site cleared and uh, the new uh, warehouse to the south of the application site. Again, you can see whole road running along the south. Uh, a couple of photographs of the site. So this is looking across the site from uh, Chessingham Park which is to the north. So this is the, uh, the, the storage building that I just referred to. Uh, this is the northern edge of the site uh, with its, um, uh, with its uh, tree line. And this looks from uh, to the entrance where the proposed entrance to the site is from the south. And you can see that, that tree line, which I just showed on the, the, previous, uh, the previous slide. Oh, that's it. Um, there is a very short update uh, that circulated as an amendment to paragraph 1.1 that refers to 33, uh, sorry, it refers to 50 vehicle parking space that's being provided, but actually the number is 33, uh, and that number is used in the highway network management consultation response that refers to the, uh, the, the, the 33 spaces. Um, in terms of conditions, recommending that condition 14 on the papers uh, is deleted uh, because that is uh, that is covered by condition 12 so it's unnecessary to have both conditions thank you thank you so if i could ask if there's any questions at this point for council oral thank you chair could we look at condition three You've just said that the number of parking spaces is reduced to 33, but it's only proposing two electric charging points and with the potential for another two. That seems inadequate for that number of parking spaces. Um, it is, um, it is in line with our um, supplementary planning documents. Um, which requires 5% of all car parking spaces to be provided with electric vehicle charge points, and then an additional 5%, uh, the potential to be upgraded. So that active and passive provision. So it is, um, yeah, it's- uh, will, we, uh, will we be allowed to increase that number, is it? Would it be reasonable to increase that number? Well, um, I the the I guess the whole the whole point of having SBDs and guidance mm -hmm. and local plans is to give certainty to developers. So um, there would have to be a there would have to be material considerations that that indicated um, why you would make a decision which deviated from that. I guess, and on the basis that. The whole point of the SPD is, you know, it's that's it's it's to, it's, it's, um, to provide EV charging points, but then it gives a um, it then gives a, a figure. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd be struggling to. I think we could argue that events have now overtaken that SPD. Well, I, <laughs> I guess my response to that is that it's the sort of thing that it should you should probably change the SPD yeah, rather than making an ad hoc decision on each application. Mm -hmm. And the other thing on the bottom line of that condition, it says for the exclusive use of zero emission vehicles, does that preclude hybrid vehicles? Um, I don't see why I don't see why it would. Um, it's hybrids aren't zero emission, are they? No. 
I, I, no, I, I think it's not very well worded, is it? Right. Oh, well, we can look at that. I mean, it's not a, it's only a note, so we wouldn't be sending down an enforcement officer to to unplug a hybrid vehicle. <laughs> um, well, it says it there as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Okay. Any council pressure? Um, just um, I did have one question, perhaps. Um, but just following on from that, it might be helpful for this planning committee to ask for a note to explain what lies behind this, um, because obviously there are different types of charges, which it doesn't explain. Presumably these would be fast charges, but it doesn't say, whereas um, rapid and ultra rapid charges are provided at the hyper hubs and in the car parks and other places. And it's a developing situation where more people are buying more sophisticated electric vehicles. So there's quite a lot of detail really to to what lies behind a policy like this, but clearly it's something the planning committee is concerned about each time it sees it mm -hmm. in a paper when it does seem in seem inadequate at least. It might be useful to get some kind of explanation. I don't know what people think. I can, it was a, a, a the, the low emission strategy was uh, written by colleagues in public protection. Um, I can ask them if they could provide a, provide a note all right. Okay. Any further questions? Um, oh. um, I have my. I had a yep. question originally. Um, it's just a really small, quick one. I think um, there's a reference at paragraph five point eight that that solar panels and air source heat pumps are depicted in the elevations. So does that mean they're conditioned anyway? Five point eight. Um, I do write these down wrong sometimes. Oh, is it? But I think you just re referred to it as well, didn't you? Um, they are shown on the on the roof. Uh, the solar PV is shown on the roof plan. And on the uh, and on the elevations, um, I'm afraid my eyesight can't pick up. Um, That's not how it comes. Oh, well, there's heat pumps shown on there. Well, they need to. They'll need to comply with um, policy. And it's quite likely they intend to install them anyway, but I just because of their other um, sustainability conditions. But I just wondered if, if we knew if they definitely would. Uh, well, I guess that's their intention, having shown them on the approved drawings. Um, we don't we don't require this as part of a condition. The condition is. The general one, which talks about reduction of uh, of, of carbon reductions, um, in accordance with uh, policy CC one and CC two, mm. so they could come up with alternative ways of meeting that carbon reduction policy, I suppose, which they would submit um, as 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 part mm. of that requirements under condition eleven. But I I would suggest that if they've Gone to the point of showing it on the drawings, then that's part of their plans to of how to comply with that condition eleven. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nelly. Thanks. Um, Highways Network Management requested that a construction traffic management plan be conditioned, but I couldn't find that in the conditions. Is it there? And I've missed it, or is there a reason for it to not be conditioned? Um, we took the view, um, it's not in there, we would have taken the view that it wasn't considered to be necessary in this location, given, given the nature of the surroundings, size of the site, uh, and what we would consider to be the, you know, the requirements for any, uh, the, lack, the likely lack of any requirements for road closures or anything like that. Um, there's plenty of room on the site for development to take place within the uh, 
um, within the development site itself. Um, similarly, there's plenty of room within the site for contractor parking. Um, my understanding is that road, uh, the road through the villages through the village is restricted in terms of vehicle weights as well. So there's there's only really one way in and one way out. So do you know why Highway Network Management requested it as a condition? No. Okay. I'm afraid I don't. Okay. Any further questions? Can't see any. We've not got any uh, public speakers on this item. So if there are no further questions at this point, if we're happy then to move into debate and if anybody would like to make a start. Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, it seems a, <clears throat> an appropriate use of a, of a currently vacant site. Um, so I, I can see no reason for not supporting the officer recommendation. So I would um, move approval. Thank you. Anybody willing to second that? Councillor Fisher. Oh, sorry, I was expecting you to say something. Okay, there's no further debate at that point then, if we're happy then to move to the vote. And Gareth, if you could just um, give us a summary of where we are and the, yeah. the sort of minor changes that have come out along the way. So it's uh, the uh, it's moved the approval subject to the Section 106 agreement, um, subject to the amendment to the condition in the, in the update and also the uh, amendment to condition three uh, to to eliminate the um, the uncertainty over the use of the word zero emissions uh, in in that condition. Okay, thank you. If I could then see all those in favour. Okay, so I think that is unanimous and and that's approved. Okay, thank you very much. So if we can move on then to item four B, uh, which is the Northminster Business Park. Thank you, Chair. So this is an application for uh, a security cabin at the entrance of the Northminster Business Park. So Northfield Lane, which uh, goes up to the um, Burbridge Road at the uh, Park and Ride on here, and the entrance to the business park uh, or the business park is in his uh, vehicle uh, access is taken from this this point here and there's a there's a gate at the moment and the proposal is for this security cabin uh, just sitting outside of the gates uh, the site is in the general extent of the green belt so wider site plan so again northfield lane is the gates and you see the, the site develops out um, of note, these six residential properties sitting to the east of the site on the opposite side of uh, Northfield Lane. Elevations of the of the of the cabin, which is a, a, a clad um, shipping container, I believe. Photographs. So you can see the gates set back from the entrance to the park the cabin will go here um, this is looking south so those cars are parked outside those six um, houses that i mentioned earlier and here's the access to the site and uh globe view again it's the there's the there's the gates is the location of the cabin 
and there's the residential properties. I think that's it, yes. Okay, any questions at this point from the committee? Uh, Councillor Melly. Um, thanks. Actually, this is a really helpful picture because I was trying to understand from the plans. Um, so the report says that um, the proposal is considered to fall with an exception and PPF paragraph 149, which is about developing previously developed land and so not impacting on the openness of the, of the green belt. But then the report also says that it's um, the development would be on a grassy area and involve removing some vegetation and it, that is outside the entrance. So I was trying to understand whether it is on previously developed land or whether it's outside of the kind of developed area. So it's on the outside of this kind of tree border and it's not in line or inside the boundary of any kind of developed or tarmac area. It's on the grassy area outside. Um, it's this location here. So this uh, this this blue line shows the extent of the uh, the extent of the business park, uh, and um, Harwood Road is is part of the business park. So I would say uh, anything within. In, my view is anything within that uh, within that location, so south of Harwood Road and west of Northfield Lane, could be reasonably considered to be within the developed area. I think mean, it only exists that 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 um, that verge only exists because it's been developed in the way it's been developed with that access road and then. The uh, the the office buildings and the car parking be, be, uh, below it. Okay, Councillor Oral. Mm -hmm. uh, paragraph five fourteen uh, details or talks about uh, those business. Some businesses are being uh, have restrictions on the weekday and Saturday opening, and some businesses don't. Is there? A, do you know the numbers of ones that? That have the restrictions and those that don't. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, the the original application for the business park um, from the late nineteen nineties um, that was allowed on appeal. Uh, that included the restriction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 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 that was closely followed by a um, a revised submission that was dealt with by City of York Council, and that um, uh, and that also had the restriction. But by the time we get to outline permissions from two thousand and two, the restrictions have not been applied. Um, Pavers, uh, which is quite a large, it's yeah. not actually on this. Uh, it doesn't have one. Further down here. Um, that's not subject to the condition on its, mm -hmm. on its warehousing use and the recent DPD um, yeah, yeah. distribution centre. That's also not, isn't subject to that condition. Do we know if there's been any issues with enforcing for the ones that do have the condition? Uh, I didn't see any records of enforcement. Mm. On that. Mm. Okay. Thank you. But there are a lot of buildings and a lot of, so I, I can't. I can't say I was exhaustive, but my um, uh, I, I didn't see any specific reference to that condition. Councillor Crackhill. Um, Ed, I think it's paragraph 515. Yes, just while we were looking. Um, you say that it wouldn't be reasonable um, to introduce a condition as um, I think some of the objectors have requested to um, attach hours of, of to attach a blanket hours to the whole site through this application because clearly that would be overriding some of those other applications you've just mentioned. But would it be reasonable to consider, if we wish to, um, applying an hours of use of the a condition restricting hours of use of the cabin?
I think it, um, it, it rather negates the reason for, um, for, for applying for the cap in itself. Um, I think you'd have to, for such a condition to be reasonable, I think you'd have to, you'd have to identify um, harm from the harm from the cabin um and that's not really the the issue is comings and goings the issues for the objector are comings and goings from from the unrestricted uh buildings within the site itself um and i guess ultimately there are no planning conditions requiring a gate there are no planning conditions requiring that the gate is open and closed at certain hours so I suppose ultimately, if 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 the site became too difficult to run without the cabin, they could just leave the gates open. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further questions at this point? Not if we could uh, move on then to our public speakers. Um, the local objectors were not able to. Uh, attend this evening so they've asked me well I asked if they'd like us to uh, or to, for me to read out a statement from them um, and in response they've asked me to read out um, an early email um, that they sent Councillor Melly and I uh, which I'm happy to do and Jane if you could time me for three minutes and it's quite a long email but I'll see how far down um, I get. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll miss out the introductory paragraph. So, however, your office's hands are apparently tied by a system that only allows them to pass comment on the narrowest definition for an approve reject, and an innocuous security shed in itself does not pose an issue. However, everything that it represents is very much a major issue for the local residents and indeed local democracy. It also demonstrates the desperate need for some strategic thinking by the council on this business park and access to it. Um, we've copied our objection letter to the planning application below, which lays out our grave concerns. We live diagonally opposite the entrance exit to Northminster, only 30 metres away, and are already plagued by the noise of lorries coming and going during the daytime, as well as early morning motorbikes. It is already impossible to sleep with windows open in warm weather. That is not the way life in York should be. Worse, this application seeks to pave the way to make it easier for these lorries to come and go 24 hours a day. The application claims that there is a problem now with lorries waiting for a security firm to come out, which is untrue. If there was an issue, we would have already had cause to complain to the council and Northminster. They have created an excuse that does not exist. This issue has arisen as there is seemingly no barrier placed to Northfield's expansion plans. Applications have recently been waved through despite our objections that have greatly expanded its size onto Greenbelt land and Grade A agricultural land, and apparently without restriction as to operating hours. This is contrary to earlier applications. Indeed, the local residents believed we were, we were protected by a blanket time ban on lorries loading and unloading, something which we are alarmed to find does not seem to apply to recent applications. Surely this is a serious error. It is as though lo the local residents don't exist. In the neighbourhood consultation and plan for Upper Popperton, which was approved by 91% of the residents, it stated there should be no expansion to Northminster Business Park, this has clearly been totally ignored by the City Council as recent applications for huge incursions into the green belt have suddenly been approved and it all adds to traffic. So what is the point of having a neighbourhood plan? Uh, despite much work by the Parish Council, it is basically worthless. Local democracy has been overridden. So I'm asking for you to draw a mark in the sand over this application and for a strategic review into what has been and is, is going on at the site, which has become an out of control monster the bottom line is that we would have less of an issue with it if the traffic did not go within 30 metres of our houses and a separate access to the site was built off the A1237, which would not go past anybody's homes. We have a right to enjoy our homes in peace and quiet, not just at night, and we are looking to you to protect the rights of residents over and above those of Northminster. Okay, so I think that's just under three minutes. So thank you to the residents for, for sending that through. 
Um, and if we could then move on to our next public speaker, who is Alistair Gill, who's uh, speaking in support of the application. Um, and yes. Good afternoon, Chair and Councillors. My name is Alistair Gill, and I'm the Development Surveyor for Northminster Properties, the freehold owners of Northminster Business Park. I'm here to speak in support of the application before you. Northminster Business Park is a private estate. As the developers and estate managers of the park, Northminster are constantly assessing how the park runs. It has become apparent that there is now a need for a constant security presence on site. The security cabin will provide necessary shelter and welfare facilities for a security guard who will be present throughout the night. The need for this security presence is for a number of reasons. Firstly, over the course of the last couple of years, there has been an increase in the number of break-ins on site. A security presence will help prevent such occurrences. Secondly, there have been complaints by the environmental health team from local residents about HGV drivers parking up in the entrance to the park and leaving their engines running overnight. When the CCTV footage has been analysed, it was found that these HGVs were not visiting the park. They are instead using the entrance as a rest stop overnight. The security presence will ensure that this does not happen. Thirdly, a security presence on the existing gates will facilitate the easier and more efficient access and egress of vehicles to and from the park. Currently, vehicle occupants have to get out of their vehicles in order to activate the gates. The presence of a security guard at the gates will reduce the time that vehicle engines are left idling, as there will be no need for the driver to leave their vehicle. Northminster Business Park was first developed in 1998. At that time, a decision was made to install gates at the entrance to the park for security purposes. There has never been any hours of restriction in place for occupiers carrying out their business. There were only certain hours of restriction put in place on deliveries to certain buildings. A number of buildings on the park have no restrictions on deliveries whatsoever. All occupiers are currently able to access the gates by way of a security fob there are no planning conditions governing, governing the operation of the gates. As such, the entrance to the park is used on a 24-7 basis by a variety of vehicles that have a legitimate right to gain access that are not subject to any planning restrictions imposed by conditions. The siting of the cabin Inn is in a location where the need for the building arises adjacent to the existing gates. The timber clad cladding will be viewed in the context of surrounding development where the adjacent buildings are of a much greater scale and prominence. The modest cabin will be screened by the existing mature landscaping, so it will not be visible beyond the immediate vicinity of its location. In summary, we believe that the erection of a security cabin will provide a number of benefits, not only to Northminster Business Park and its occupants, but also to local residents, as I have explained. We would therefore ask that the committee approve the application before them. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just bear with us, I'll just ask if the committee have got any questions. Councillor Fenton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think one of the <clears throat> sort of issues raised by residents is um, deliveries at either early in the morning or, or late at night. Do you think the, <clears throat> the existence of the cabin would make any material difference to <clears throat> either the frequency of deliveries or uh, the time of those deliveries? Uh, no, I don't. As I said earlier, all businesses, uh, occupiers, uh, et cetera, have access fobs. So if they are able under their conditions to, to, to carry out deliveries, then they do so, as is at the moment. In terms of monitoring buildings that do have conditions, we have a, a very strict covenant within the long lease for all businesses that they must operate under their planning conditions. We are based on site and we do monitor that and it's part of the management rules. And if there are any problems, we go straight to the owners of those buildings to iron them out. Though, as uh, Gareth said earlier, uh, as far as I'm aware, there has never been any um, enforcement. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fenton, do you have any? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I'm just, just trying to 
pursue that a bit further. You say that every all the businesses have a fob, which I obviously understand. They can can access the site at any time of the night if they wish to. But presumably, if they're getting various kinds of deliveries, then obviously they have to arrange to be there during the night if that's when they arrive. So isn't it reasonable to assume that if you have a security person in the cabin, you know, they might not, they might not at the moment arrange to actually come out during the night just to receive a delivery, but if they have a security person on site, then that will become a lot easier. Uh, no, because a delivery has to physically deliver to yeah. the building, and therefore there would have to be someone to receive the Into delivery. The building. I suppose that depends how they how they operate. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Sorry. Were you saying something? I couldn't quite hear what you were saying just then. What? You were yes. muttering. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I did. I said. I suppose that depends how each company operates. Really, whether it actually has to be let into the building or whether they make some arrangements as to where it goes, depending on what it is. Okay. Yeah. There's no further questions and I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Um, I just noticed as well, I probably should have read out from the objectors earlier email, uh, a request basically from them for the committee to defer the application um, so that there can be a site visit um, to see for, for ourselves before any further development. Um, I'll just add that on to, to the earlier comments. Okay, if there's any further questions for Gareth? No, we're happy then to move into a debate and if anybody's willing to make a start. Cast a look here. If nobody's going to say a word, I will. I, I think in some ways this might um, improve the situation. Um, if it's going to deter, which I'm sure it will, uh, vehicles that are using that entrance as a convenient parking spot where they can park up for a few hours or whatever, um, if that's going to, in a sense, be curtailed, I think that might be a positive move. And I think it's it's a fairly modest um, addition to the site. Um, and I, I'm, I'm reasonably in favor of approving it. So I will move approval. Thank you. Anybody willing to second, Councillor Fenton? Um, yeah, happy to second that. I think <clears throat> the issues that the residents raise our um, legitimate concerns, but <clears throat> I think seeking to resolve those through this application is um, would be um, un unreasonable and, and, and I, <clears throat> I really don't think would, um, would, would stand up scrutiny. So whilst <clears throat> yeah, any concerns that, that residents have a, should quite rightly be investigated by environmental health and others. Um, <clears throat> I think in the context of this particular application, I, I can see no grounds for for refusal or deferral. Okay, Councillor Oral and then Councillor. Uh, Mr Gill did sort of preempt the question I was going to ask as to whether they enforced uh, the rules for people that don't have uh, access uh, during evenings and uh and weekends so that was reassuring in a way that the, uh, mr gill said they were um onto that situation and and would pursue it if it was breached so uh, i hope that continues to be the case okay that's a correct one yeah just very quickly i can see where this is going um i just wanted to say that when i first started reading this i thought yeah an innocuous cabin there's no problem with the cabin itself there's no problem with this but i just feel as i've read it further and read through all the details that um a 20 you know 24 hour access through the gates uh, all night security means a 24 hour site really i can i can see the residents concerns about this facilitating that that direction of travel really so I'm, I'm not going to support it okay 
Okay. Any further debate? Are we happy to, Councillor Melly? <clears throat> Um, that was my thought as well. It's not inexpensive to hire someone to work all through the night. Presumably, it's with the intention that there will be significant vehicle movements in the night. Um, also, it is in the green belt. And although, you know, we're told it's in the blue line of the boundary of the site, it is outside of the entrance to the site. It's on an area which currently is grass and other plants. <laughs> it's outside of the kind of tree line shielding the site. Um, so I'm, I, but in terms of the residents concerns and in terms of openness of the green belt, you know, it's surrounded by other development. I don't think it will impact the openness of the green belt. I haven't, haven't got any other, I don't think it will, as Councillor Fenton said, I don't think there's anything in this application which necessarily directly relates to the concerns that residents have about the wider site, um, so I can't see any reason for refusal. Okay. Hey, Gareth, if you're able to give us a quick summary. Thanks, Chair. So, uh, so it's been moved that the application is approved and subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Okay, if I could see then all those in favour. Okay, all those against? And any abstentions? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that's agreed. Okay, thank you very much. If we could move on then to item 4C, which is the uh, Minster Stone Yard. Give Gareth a minute. So. I should say as well, we'll take item four C and four D together but we'll need two separate votes at the end for the two items okay thank you chair the so there are there are two planning applications on the agenda uh, by the the, the by the chapter uh, in respect of their proposals for a center of excellence for heritage craft skill and estate management um, the Centre of Excellence is intended to address a heritage skills shortage, and the Minster's stone yard is considered to be constrained and inadequate for the purpose. Um, the stone yard proposal is referred to as the technology hub, and you'll see that referred to in the report. Proposals at the deanery, which is um, the item um, that we'll consider after this, is referred to as the heritage quad. Uh, both applications are accompanied by list of building consent applications. Um, Stone Yard, uh, I'm afraid it's an incredibly busy drawing. Uh, the Stone Yard is, um, it's in this triangle of streets formed by Dean Gate and Goodrum Gate, with the uh, former Minster Song School to the southwest. Uh, it's in the Central Historic Core Conservation Area. It's in the area of archaeological importance. And it's not listed, um, but the majority of the properties from the, the Cross Keys Public House southwards along Goodrum Gate are listed. Properties opposite are listed. This actually gives a better view of the, the, the area of the application site. So roughly speaking, I'll just move the, the pointer. That is the site. Um, I should have said, and this is relevant to the list of building consent, that one of the properties, I believe number 36, Mark will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which is a listed building, 
by virtue of the proposals which are intended has to has a, a rear boundary wall which needs to be increased in height and that's the reason why there is a listed building consent application along with this one so the proposals uh generally are the demolition of the existing buildings within the yard our members will be aware of the the two uh, access points through uh, for Dean Gate from the um, through the building, the archway uh, access points, and then construction of a new roof over this area uh, with a mezzanine floor at one end, and then reordering of the retained buildings to provide workshops, storage, and office space. So going through the proposals in detail. So this is the application, the existing ground floor plan. Um, so uh, all the buildings within the yard, as I said, will be will be demolished. And uh, this is the proposed plan. So this shows the outline of the of the roof over that, the mezzanine floor, and then uh, the reordered spaces within the retained buildings surrounding. Existing roof plan, so that shows this this agglomeration of additions within that uh, within the yard. The proposal is for one uh, one structure covering the whole of that that space. In elevation, um, see that dotted line shows the outline of the roof uh, behind. The retained facade. Um, you will be able to see the the new gable end um, in the, the 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 void between the cross keys and the site. And uh, in true elevation, you see part of the roof there. But in reality, that the, um, perhaps in long distance views, you might be able to pick out um, uh, pick out that structure. Uh, this is the elevation, so that's the uh, existing um, stone yard offices, so entirely hiding the uh, the roof structure. Again, from Goodrum Gate, the outline of the of the roof structure shown in outline. Again, slightly peaking above that lower building, um, which is part of the the the, the chapter of state. Um, this is the existing cross section along the back of those Goodrum Gate properties. Of note here is the uh, the roof terrace for the bar at number forty, known as the Habit. There, and here is the. Uh, um, I think this is the area where the wall needs to be uh, needs to be raised. Here, the proposed cross section shows the new roof structure. And the raising of the the raising of that boundary wall. Uh, that's a long cross section through the site. And this is a 3D model of the proposed roof. So uh, it's the, the 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 curved segments are set away from the boundary wall by this flat roofed area. And they're set away from the existing um, Dean Gate buildings as well by a similar, similar um, structure. And here's that gable which um, which you saw between Cross Keys and the uh, and Fort Dean Gate. Um, this illustrates the the point made by the objector. Um, set out in 4.1 on page 59. So this is the existing view from the terrace of 40 Goodrum Gate. And this is the proposed view. So that's that flat, flat roofed area. And then the roof uh, behind. I would say that these are these aren't verified images. Um, uh, so 
members, as always, should make their decision on the basis of the elevations that have been drawn, elevations that have been shown. But this, uh, these are designed to, to help illustrate that situation. And uh, similarly, that's the, the, the gable of the, of the structure where currently the view is of the rear of those good and great properties. And that's the end of the end of the show. Uh, there is an update. Um, and Mark, could you just uh, could you um, go through that? You go through the item, uh, both items at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, as regards um, an update to members, um, we have received one uh, additional letter of support that has come from the York Conservation Trust. Um, the summary of which is provided in the um, update document. Um, as regards uh, additional conditions in relation to item 4C, which is the um, planning application, um, primarily um, additional conditions securing um, more uh, more more uh, sort of higher le sort of lower level more details in terms of the um, works proposed so um, one relating to a replacement window that will go in that will replace an existing doorway in the rear of the existing um, building uh, at four Dean gate uh, and then construction details for the roof um, primarily to um, ensure a, a, a suitable um, external appearance and tying into the existing elements of, of, of the building. Um, as regards item 4D, which is the LBC, um, a condition requiring the materials and specification um, of the mortar to be used in the lifting of the wall at the rear of 36 Goodroom Gate. Um, and then details of the materials and, and fixings for the um, wall capping. So that's the the um, the uh, the pink areas where the, the flat roof meets the the existing wall. And yeah, and again a, a large scale um, construction detail plan. Showing um, how the how the new structure will interact and tie into the existing um, structures along the properties to the rear of Goodrum Gate. And that's it for by way of update for, for those items. Okay, so if there's any questions at this point for the planning officers, that's Emily. How does the height of the proposed roof compare to the height of the roofs it would be replacing? In terms of the heights along the, the section at the rear of 36 will be increased. I don't have the distance, the, the actual measurements to hand. Um, in terms of the uh, roof terrace at number 40, the wall immediately on the boundary stays um, as is, and then the, the the height increase is introduced further back, so that that, that flat roof standoff is to deals with a, a couple of aspects. It it reduces the span of the distance the span of the roof has to cover, which also in turn allows it to be as compact as it as it, as it can be. Um, I think in one of the visuals, the the height, the, the maximum height overall is very similar, if not only very similar, I think, to the there's a there's a monopitch roof in the middle of the site. There's a maximum height. Um, the 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 peak of the the new roof would be wouldn't be too dissimilar to that. So it's the the mock that sort of shadowed bit that sits at the eaves height of um, of the existing of um, the prop the building on Dean Bank. 
think not in uh, paragraph five point four four. Uh, there's some uh, there's some reference points on it. Um, the height of the lowest point of the roof span is approximately two point five meters higher than the existing roof terrace at number forty. And then uh, that offset you talked about is two point one meters uh, away from that party wall. Highest part of the roof, four point seven five above the existing roof terrace level. But that point is 9.7 meters away from the roof terrace so that's the center of the roof um yeah so that's that point there or that point there. okay do you have a, a follow-up councilman uh i have a different question um paragraph 130 of the national planning policy framework says that plan planning decisions should ensure that developments will achieve being sympathetic to local character and history um i was just wondering how much weight that has um yeah when we're when we're weighing up the benefits and harms yeah, it seems like quite strong wording saying that it will ensure that yeah will ensure that it achieves that well a government policy is a material consideration in in this location we have a neighborhood plan which has that statutory weight which is set out in the um in the report uh but the it's important with the mppf to it it always says the document should be read as a whole rather than necessarily honing in on specific uh specific wording but it's you know that's 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 national policy on on design and has has that weight behind it okay any further questions i can't say any so i think we could move on then to our public speaker who's um Alice, alexander mccallion uh who's speaking in support of uh both uh, item 4C and 4D. Um, but yes, if you'd like to make a start your own time, Neil, now you've got three minutes to address the committee. Um... Thank you and uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, my name is Alex McCallion. I am the Director of Works and Precinct at York Minster. Um, the applications before you this afternoon form one of the major projects of our recently adopted neighbourhood plan, namely our vision to establish the York Minster Precinct as a world-class campus facility for research, education, and training in ancient craft skills, as well as cutting edge technology. This is the first of two buildings to be determined, which are codependent. One cannot be delivered without the other. The technology hub will be housed on the site of the current stone yard and will incorporate additional space for your Glazier's Trust on Deangate. The site currently comprises a range of buildings dating from the 19th to the late 20th centuries. The space will be reordered to house a state-of-the-art five-access CNC saw and a cutting-edge bandsaw built by Breton in Italy. A new entrance will enable visitors to enter and watch operations from a dedicated viewing platform. New lifting systems will be installed, including a rail system to collect the stone from deliveries on Deangate, and additional space created to reinforce our supply of stone on site. A new drawing office will be created with modern IT and digital technology installed as an additional tool to the traditional setting out process and refurbished support workshops will be provided for electricians, plumbers, joiners, heritage builders and the department management. Investment in digital technology will include photogrammetry, laser scanning, BIM and digital twinning. The hub will include the latest in low carbon and renewable technologies with an average of 70% of the power for the development coming from solar tiles in the new roof structure. Rainwater will also be collected and all water used in the processing of stone, collected, filtered and recycled. With the generous support of York Minster Fund and through their research and development programme, this is a fully funded project. With a success successful planning permission, we could be on site in quarter 2023. We have a holding slot for the manufacturers of our saws. That's a £620,000 investment in cutting edge saws alone. This will be a unique facility in the cathedral world and provide York with a truly national and international centre of excellence. 
It will further demonstrate that York is a world leader in heritage conservation and management, but also a city embracing the future with confidence. I respectfully urge members to please support this application to help us deliver this unique facility. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're able to just hang on a sec, I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Councillor Fenton. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. One of the comments from one of the objectors <clears throat> in relation to the roof, <clears throat> um, they claimed that <clears throat> the height of the room, the height of the roof was was for, for aesthetics rather than for a <clears throat> practical benefit. So I wondered if you could explain <clears throat> the, the rationale behind the the design of the roof as proposed, please. Of course, you, you'll remember from looking at the plans, the roof is actually pulled back from the boundary wall and sits above a, a flat roof. The objector, um, he and I met um, a couple of months ago and um, I explained the plans to him in detail and there had been a misunderstanding of thinking that the roof came up to the boundary wall. The uh, and, and, and I was assured the objection would be withdrawn. It obviously hasn't been, but um, members can see from the uh, CGI that the roof is not in fact blocking the view of the Minster from the terrace and actually the uh, existing wall. There is a flat roof where they have pots on at the moment. They'll be continue to be able to have their pots sitting there. The roof height is dictated by the area that we can put the roof vault, which has to be high enough to put the CNC saws below. So um, that's what's dictating that. And also to ensure that we have the proper coverage for the solar panels and um, that will be embedded in that roof. Okay, any further questions from the committee? Can't see any, so I'll, I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. We'll move on then, if there are any final questions for Gareth at this point. If not, if we're happy to, uh, to move into debate. Um, I'll look around again, Councillor Looker. I'm really very delighted that um, I had the opportunity as a substitute to actually come to this meeting because um, this is a project that I've been following, as I said at the beginning, very closely. But I, I was reserving my judgment on it until I um, saw what it was going to look like. And I have to say, I found the virtual site visit um, extremely useful, extremely helpful. And it persuaded me um, that I think in many ways, this is going to be an absolutely fascinating added dimension to York's landscape. The city centre, if you stand up high enough, and sometimes you, the only place you can go and look at it is the mansion house. But um, if you stand up really high on in York, what is very interesting is the tight network of roofs all the different roofs we saw it on some of the photographs that were shown this this evening um they are i i think the roofscape is is one of the most fascinating things of the medieval and the slightly later city and especially in the city center where it's all a jumble and this seems to me to be adding a 21st century dimension to that roofscape it isn't trying to be a copy of a tiled medieval roof. It is stating something quite different. And although when I looked at it on the simulated projections that were created at the site visit, I thought, hmm, I'm not sure. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yes, yes, give us another hundred years. God, if we last that long. Um, and it will be a valued part of York's roofscape. I'm delighted. We very rarely see anything very different, anything very novel in our designs. And I think this is an extraordinary opportunity. The purposes, I absolutely endorse what is said by the York Conservation Trust. They, they've stated it very well. It's long been a concept of mine that York ought to be at the heart of apprenticeships and training and teaching and learning, 
creating master craftsmen in those heritage skills that are not going to vanish. We are still going to need people who can fix ancient stonework. We are still going to need people who can fix ancient railways. Just because we're moving in a more different world doesn't mean those old skills aren't absolutely essential if we're going to keep the diversity of our landscapes and of our buildings. So I think this is just excellent. I think the concept is good, um, but I am actually quite bowled over by the design of the roof. And I think, I think it will become something that is quite in the future iconic. It takes us ages to get used to it, good Lord. It took us ages to get used to pedestrianisation of Coney Street, but we did get there in the end and decided it was a good thing. So I'm hopeful that this will be seen as a good thing. But the purpose is first class. I see we're happy to move. Yes. Any Anybody willing to second that? Councillor Crocker? Yeah. I try not to just say the same thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think this is a very, very positive application. Um, I think in planning terms, um, in terms of what we have to look at, um, the paper is clear that this is at the lower end of less than substantial harm vis-a-vis -vis the heritage assets. Um, and clearly there are huge benefits in terms of supporting the development of heritage skills, apprenticeships, creating jobs, education and, and the sort of global network of um, heritage skills that the Minster is, is, is becoming a part of in terms of developing a centre of excellence. But I would also agree with Councillor Looker that I really think the modern design is something to be to rec be recommended, not just um, not just looked at as a harm. I think it is to be um, recommended um, as representing York as a, a city that's based on history but looks to the future and also represents sustainability and commitment to carbon reduction at the same time. So um, yeah, I think the planning balance, I very much support this. Okay, any further comment? No? Gareth, are you able to give us a quick summary? So I ask to move that planning permission uh, be granted, um, subject to the conditions in the report, as updated by uh, the uh, the additional conditions um, on the update. Um, I would ask actually if because um, the, these uh, the the additional conditions were only uh, drafted quite quite recently. I would ask if uh, members could. Uh, delegate the final wording of those additional conditions to officers just so I can have another look at them before issuing. That's a crack right. Sorry. Could I just add something in I forgot to um say? Um, um I would like to ask I, I can see that the um hours of work are included in the conditions. But I think there was a request for a CEMP, but that's only there. Is it there as an informative? Could we just include either a CM, CMP or elements of that actually in the conditions? Because with the best will in the world, um, I think it's helpful to actually have that as a condition. Uh, you know, so things like dust, noise, yes. impact on neighbours. Yeah. Um, yes. We didn't recommend it because it's not a, I mean, it's quite a constrained site, but it's not a very big development. And we, mm. we tend to target the, the construction environment management plans at those, at those sites, which will have uh, a lot of impact for a, a long period of time. But if, if members feel that it's necessary in this location, then it is it's not unreasonable. I saw Councillor look and nodding when Councillor Cranfield suggests. Yes, it's amazing how tightly a residential site it is, actually. There are a lot of people living in Goodrum Gate. You don't expect them to be there, but they are. Um, so I think, yes, we do need to put that in. Thank you. So we'll add that to the, to the list of amendments. Um, yes. I can't remember if there was something at the end of what you were going to say that... 
Yes, and that we were happy with the. We tend to ramble. We were happy with the um, final wording being delegated as well. Yeah, I just wanted to check that. Okay. I think we're there. Oh, no. Could I see then all those in favour? Okay, it's unanimous. So thank you very much. We can move on then. We just need to vote as well on item four uh, D, uh, and I assume Councillor Looker and Craig Hill are happy to propose and second that as well. So I think we can move straight to the to vote on that unless there's anything. Uh, no, they, um, as with uh, item 4C, and subject to that delegated wording. Okay. Okay, so I could see then all those in favour. Okay, so that's unanimous as well, so that's approved as well. Okay. Thank you, so I think we can move straight on to items 4E and F. So uh, this application is uh, part of the Centre of Excellence proposals referred to as the, the Heritage Quad. So the site is to the northeast of the, the deanery, which is grade two listed. Um, it includes land to the rear of um, numbers one to two, Minster Court, which are grade two star listed and it's adjacent to the city walls which is grade one listed um, it's within the central historical conservation area the area of archaeological importance and within the cathedral precinct scheduled ancient monument the proposals are for the conversion of the the deanery garages and construction of a new single-storey um, extension to form stonemasons workshops, living accommodation for apprentices and additional ancillary accommodation. Um, just on this side, so that there's one to two Minster Court, and there's the Deanery, Minster Library, um, Grace Court Hotel, City Walls, Lord Mayor's Walk. Uh, this drawing shows areas of demolition, and so they illustrate that part of the site is a is a conversion. The uh, proposed ground floor plan. So this is the area. This is the converted uh, part of the building um, with. Uh, Garaging, storage, um, toilet facilities, and office, stonemasons, workshops. And then this is the apprentice's accommodation. So that's all at ground floor level. Additional buildings, um, the scaffolding store, and uh, a breakout space. It shows the, uh, the roof plan single uh creates a single building um under this uh under this uh, roof design here in elevation so this is the this is from the the, the southwest so the, the the front of the site so to speak uh this is the uh the the northeast which is the site the side of the site which faces the city walls these glazed elements at the rear 
um, northwest elevation, so the side elevation, uh, reference point being the, the city walls here. And then the, the other side elevation, again, with the, the, the city wall walkway. Section through the site. So this is that, that, that um, the new building um, with the stonemasons workshop from the southwest. And then this is the section through the workshop itself. You can see the, the outline of the city wall gray down just there. Yeah. Cross sections again showing that um, that distinctive roof form and its relationship to the walls and the deanery. The scaffolding store, the breakout pavilion. Uh, this is a drawing which shows the existing mass on the side. So you see the outline of the proposed building, and then in red, uh, the roof of the um, the roof of the garages, and there is the outline of that element which backs onto the walls, which is to be uh, to be demolished. And uh, a CGI showing um, the view from the walls of the site. And then one into that courtyard that members would have seen enclosed by the uh, new walls and the roof. So this is the, uh, this is the boundary wall of the, uh, of one and, of the garden of one and two Minster Court. Apprentices accommodation there, the workshop in there and then the ancillary accommodation and garaging on this side. Oh, and there is a um, another aerial photograph from a different direction. We also have a, um, a series of CGI's uh, which uh, Let's see if this works. So there's the, the, the deanery and the site of the garages. And then um, I, I thought when I first saw that, I thought it was just a blurred image, but it is actually thinking about it, how the roof would look from that distance because of that standing seam um, and the way it falls away from this high point. The new proposals. Um, again, we're not aware of any independent verification of the of the height. Um, or the representation of the materials, um, but on the basis that there is an existing building there, um, we would hope that those those would be relatively accurate uh, in terms of building heights anyway, and, uh, and footprints. Uh, these are from the walls themselves. So this looks down into the, into the stonemasons workshop. This is um, Grace Court. So there is a glimpsed view because of the uh, because of the vegetation. It's a very small element visible from this from this um, uh, this particular site. And the members obviously it's a dynamic view when you walk along the walls, but um, you have to pick a pick a view from somewhere. Looking the other way, so the, the city walls are behind the uh, the shot.
and then from Minster Court, just be able to pick out the the new development at the end of this this access way, and then this will be from the deanery itself. And that's the end of that um, that particular presentation. I can either keep those up or go back to the uh, the presentation. <laughs> two members want to see any other images? No. Okay, but then any updates? Oh yes. Right. So there is an update. Mark will run through. Um, with regards um, updates on on these items for the deanery, um, the one additional letter of support that was received from the conservation trust that we referenced in earlier applications in regards to the uh, planning application, summary of which is provided in the pack. Um, number of uh, additional conditions uh, being recommended now. One of which uh, was details of foul and surface. Uh, drainage has come from our flood risk management team um, and additional co uh, additional um, condition relating to uh, detailed design of the foundations uh, for the breakout pavilion given their proximity to um, tree T26 which is to be retained on the site. Um, primarily just to ensure that the um, tree is protected as best it can be. We've refined the, as regards the existing conditions set out in the um, reports pack, uh, re refine, would propose a refinement to condition two for the exterior materials. Um, along with um, refinement to condition 17, which is the occupancy condition. Um, the change there is to specifically tie it to apprentices at the Minster rather than generic um, apprentices who may or may not be on courses elsewhere. <clears throat> uh, as regards the listed building application, um, Additional conditions requiring, uh, again, very similar to the stone yard, those fine fine details of how the 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 new will tie into the old. So, uh, sample materials panel uh, details of uh, boundary treatments, uh, a methodology for uh, realigning the existing stone wall that's between the deanery um, along the access drive, and construction details of how the retained uh, garden wall, which was in the, just to the, um, how the existing garden wall to the properties on Minster Court will tie into the new development. So yeah, so this we so, so potentially just see it glimpse through the, uh, the void there on the elevation, the boundary wall will be incorporated into the interior of the, um, the apprentice accommodation. So it's it's just details as how the, how the mechanics and logistics of tying all that together. Uh, and that's it by way of a point. Okay. Any questions then from the committee, Councillor Fisher? And Hi, Chair. Um, could we possibly go back to the aerial view of the site uh, just to look at the actual trees that are to be lost? Because it does say that. The trees are small. Well, one of them is nine meters, and I've got a nine meter horse chestnut in my back garden, and it ain't small. Um, I suppose that's quite a substantial tree. Could we look at the ones that are actually going to be crown lifted just to see which ones they are? Because I'm very familiar with that walking along the walls along there. It's some lovely trees. I was concerned that there could be, you know, whether the damage to them is really that severe. Yeah, 
Yeah, sorry about the delay there. Um, so on the on that area limit, we've got T25 and T26 marked up as being um, on that image as, as reference. Um, then moving through the, the tree constraints plan in terms of um, trees to be... Um, remove there is one so beyond just to sort of towards the this this group here become in terms of the tree constraints plan becomes a an amalgamation of multiple things once you get into to ground level so So in there'll be there's one category U tree in amongst this group that will be removed, moving round toward to this side of the site. Again, there's another category U tree to be um, removed. I'll just retreat there with me. I'll find the table where the Do you have any did you have questions in relation to any particular yeah, tree? Actually, just the one for the only T25. That one. Yeah, so T21. Yeah, so it's been been identified um, as an apple tree, and there is there are no works recommended to it on that one. Any others? No. Thank you very much indeed. That's how I was a bit concerned about apple tree because it's beautiful when it's in blue. Okay. Any further questions, Councillor Melly? Could you please go back to the proposed ground floor plan so we can see the um, accommodation more clearly? It's very small in the papers. Yeah, actually, that's not much clearer. So um, each of the bedrooms has um, a private bathroom, but then the and then the communal space is that kind of kitchen and living area at the top. Yes. Yeah. So the, you've got the um, communal uh, kitchen living space at the top with the communal sort of outdoor space just to the right hand side of that in the garden area. Then beneath that, you have the six um, study bedrooms that comprise of uh, sort of a workstation desk and um, bed and a, a sort of a, a shower, a shower room, WC pod. And then each room has a small sort of outdoor terrace area along that to right hand flank and then into that open garden area to the side. And where's the apple tree in relation to all this? It's 
It's just outside of bear with me. Um, and the cycle parking is that in the bottom left somewhere? Yeah, so the cycle parking's just out of that zoomed in shot where um to the sort of the side of the scaffolding store along the um bottom there and the condition also secures more um as we uh, in accordance with the uh, recommendations from Hiros. Yeah, I saw there was a condition saying there needs to be at least 14 cycle parking spaces, but I wasn't sure if there was space for that in the plans. Or whether the plans have to be amended slightly or... They might have to be... I think we worded the, um, we worded the condition. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's a slightly modified version of the standard condition, which um, which um, uh, will uh, necessitate some amendment to the drawing. The standard condition requires them to show details of what they've shown uh, on the submitted drawings, whereas because we require them to provide those fourteen spaces, they'll need to make a change. Because yeah, because one of the conditions is that the development needs to be carried out in accordance with the ground floor plan and then another condition is that there needs to be 14 cycle spaces so that floor plan will have to be changed uh yes probably uh yeah that, that's not that's not unusual for the approved plans to then be varied by a condition uh we could um Thinking about it, we could more accurately change that um, change that uh, standard wording of the approved plans condition to to reference uh, other than where it's varied by any of the following conditions. Something like that. Go on the to do list. Thanks. Have you managed to find this apple tree? <laughs> Maybe it's a question for the applicant and public participation. We'll carry on for the time being. Are there any other questions? No. We'll just give Mark another minute or two and then. We'll move on then to public speaker, who's uh, Alexander McCallion again. Another three minutes, and if you'd like to make a start in your own time. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Centre of Excellence for Heritage Craft Skills and Estate Management will bring significant benefits to York Minster and the heritage sector, including continuing the craft of stonemasonry and encouraging global learning and knowledge, knowledge sharing as well as bring, being a shining example of best practice in managing complex heritage estates. <clears throat> the application for the Heritage Quad will be the flagship of the centre, delivering new facilities and providing on-site living accommodation for our apprentices and those visiting from other institutions and reflects six months of intense pre-application discussion. We have partnered with Cologne, Trondheim, Washington, Pisa and Milan cathedrals, as well as the University of York, we are having conversations with institutions in New York and others around the world. We want to become the national home of the Cathedral's Workshop Fellowship. We have already invested significant money at risk to turn the vision into working planning drawings, supported by extensive archaeological research. 
The opportunities presented through our global partnerships are not lost on many of our stakeholders and the various letters of support pay testament to this. The York Minster Precinct is a living and working estate. Whilst we accept that we are causing less than substantial harm to the setting of heritage assets, we are very clear that the harm is far outweighed by the extensive public benefits. It will create employment. It will broaden our visitor experience. It will offer extensive training opportunities. It will promote York around the world. It will continue to drive our net zero agenda as we work with the city to address the climate emergency. It will inspire the next generation of craftspeople and most importantly, secure the long-term viable restoration and conservation of York Minster. We have worked hard over the past four years to produce a creative way of caring for a heritage estate through our neighborhood plan. The plan demonstrates that promoting sustainability and tackling climate change can sit comfortably alongside heritage protection. With the groundbreaking brief comes a response that has already been acknowledged as outstanding through the inclusion of the roof designs in this year's Royal Academy of Arts Summer Exhibition. The project is already signposting York. It is already inspiring people. This is award-winning architecture which will be celebrated. These applications present a once in a generation opportunity to create something very special with the potential to have a significant positive contribution to our city. It is a leading example of how the leveling up agenda can become a reality and will safeguard the future of the skills needed to care for York Minster and beyond. I respectfully urge members to please support this application to allow this ambitious vision to become a reality for York Minster, for our city, for the region and for the wider cathedral and heritage network. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. That's all. Will this allow you to have more apprenticeship? It, it will subject to, to funding, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but um, one of the key things of, of this project is we'll be providing accommodation for our first year apprentices. Mm -hmm. And to put that into concept, context, one of our first year apprentices is currently renting accommodation at the YMCA in York because he cannot find accommodation that's affordable in the city. We'll be able to provide that on site now and also put up apprentices who are coming to study with us um, when they come over from overseas or other cathedrals in the country. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Lockyer. Um, this is a curiosity because I'm not sure whether this is part of this application or whether it's something, um, uh, page one, two, three, five point one one on our papers, you talk about a new workshop to house the Minster's Masons um, with a green living room. And I wasn't sure that's not this application or is it part, where's your green living room? Because I'm really quite keen on green living rooms. Yes, I've got Mark, would, would you mind moving to the aerial photograph of the, of the site? So there are three very distinctive roof structures in the proposal. The, the first is, is the roof covering the um, garden store and the scaffold store. That's where the solar panels will be housed to, to create the energy. The central roof structure is zinc and that will collect all the rainwater for use in the gardens and, 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 and the surrounding area. And the third roof is the living roof. So under the pavilion, that, that will be the, the living green roof. That's the structure. Uh, oh, you've just gone past it. If you if you keep if you keep going back. That's it. So the pavilion on the far right hand corner, that will be the that's coloured green. Yeah. Part of the view from the city wall. You'll see it from the city wall. Yeah. And the whole vision behind the brief was that visitors would be able to engage in the process of heritage craft from the city wall. So carrying on the Mason's Lodge um, at, on Queen's Path, and which is part of the visitor journey for a lot of people in York. Okay, any further questions, Councillor Millie? Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned um, people visiting from other cathedrals and other universities. Have you seen the proposed amendment to condition 17 about the occupancy condition proposed that it should be um, exclusively occupied by people enrolled or employed by York Minster? Would that restrict 
those visiting d d yes if it's if it's stipulates that they're employed by your minister then that enrolled or employed it, it will be restricted because if say for example one of the apprentices from Milan Cathedral um, who have been over this summer if we're putting them up as drafted it will preclude them from staying in that accommodation so it's contrary to the vision behind um, that accommodation okay so I, I think if it was changed to associated with with the center of excellence well i think the original word in the condition said that um it needs to be apprentice, apprentices registered and engaged in a course within the city of york boundary so i think either wording would sounds like it would restrict that use so that might be something we have to discuss Not to any further questions, so I'll, I'll thank you for your time again this evening. Thank you. Gareth, could we just clarify the tree? Yes. So the, the apple tree T21 uh, is, is removed. So the, um, the, the tree survey is a survey of its existing condition. So it, it was presumably done without knowledge of the uh, so it was just that uh, without knowledge of the development proposals. So it, it, as, a, as a specimen, it's own right. It requires no works to be done to it. It's a category B tree, but it does sit under the building. So it would have to be removed for this development to go ahead. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions then for Gareth? No? Well, okay. I, th I think the point um, that Councillor Melly made was was an important one, because obviously um, it's, it's about who is entitled or is who able to use the accommodation. Um, which version are we watch looking at? I was uh, I was going so the recommendation is within the update. Um, I was going to. Uh, as for a, I was going to suggest a slight change in the recommendation as with the previous application so we can look at the wording of those conditions we've we've suggested and we can look at the wording of condition 17 as well not wanting it to be perhaps used by every Tom Dick and Harry who's looking for an Airbnb but um I, I'm sure we could uh, Ex express it so that it meets yeah. the requirements. Yeah, I, I think the it, it, as as discussed between um, the applicants and Councillor Melly, I think that that wouldn't that wouldn't um, go beyond the spirit of what we were intending. But it's just the wording needs to be not tightened, loosened slightly. Okay. If there's no further questions, then if we are now happy to move into debate, and I'll. Cast around for anybody willing to start, Councillor Fenton. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> it is really quite an exciting development. I think what is proposed is an improvement aesthetically on what currently exists on the site. Um, and it's good to hear from the applicant the recognition that, that does, the designers uh, has attracted in the in the architectural world. Um, as was alluded to, it there's a direct link with the previous application in terms of um, <clears throat> sort of the the, the overall vision, um, and I think it's it's something to be to be welcomed. I certainly have no um, <clears throat> no concerns about the um, the the impact on heritage assets of the proposal, um, and if the wording can be loosened in relation to <clears throat> the types of persons who may inhabit the apprentice accommodation um very happy to move through <coughs> move approval okay thank you uh anybody willing to second councillor Milley? um yeah i'm happy to second that i'm always nervous about development so close to the city halls and in the setting of the minster and so many other um heritage buildings but i think this is done well and it clearly would have um really significant benefits in terms of education and heritage um so i'm happy to second uh, the yeah what councillor fenton said okay thank you any further debate or comment no so gareth if you're happy to give us a quick summary 
So it's um, recommended for um, to remove uh, approval subject to the conditions in the report uh, as amended by the uh, additional conditions in the update and the varied conditions in the update. I'm just seeking delegated approval just to double check the wording of those recommended conditions and that includes condition 17 as well. Okay. You see not. So then can I see all those in favour? Okay, so that's the unanimous again. So thank you, that's approved. And then if we could just quickly do the list of building consent as well, and I'll assume I've been to... Yeah, thank you, Chair. The uh, list of building consents, um, again, uh, moved. No, no, it has to be moved, is not it? Uh, I'm sorry, you see that. Uh, the same moved, uh, subject to the conditions in the report, uh, the additional conditions and vary conditions in the update. Thank you. So I can see those in favour. Okay, so that's unanimous as well, so that's approved. Okay. So thank you everybody for your time this evening. There's no urgent business on the agenda, so I'll close the meeting there.